Welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, webinar from the Open Group, uh, which today is being led by Dr. Tim O'Neill. Um, before I hand over to Tim to start his presentation, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping issues to keep the event moving forward smoothly. <clears throat> so we would encourage you to uh, ask questions during this event. Um, this is one of the major objectives of bringing these events to you. Uh, there are two ways to submit a question. Uh, you can either submit a question using the text chat facility, uh, or you can use the text QA facility. In either case, can I ask you to address your questions to all, all participants? That way it gets to see all of the questions that are being uh, submitted. Both Tim and myself will uh, uh, look through the questions at the end of the presentation and do I have to answer them all for you. Um, this presentation is also being recorded, so a full audio and visual recording of this event will be available tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a, uh, an email, e email from WebEx uh, that will contain the relevant URL where you can access that recording. Um, so for any reason you have to leave today's event early or experience any local technical difficulties, then a full recording is available for you to uh, um, access uh, at your leisure uh, in the future. So if you're ready, can I ask you to start your presentation? Yeah, thank you, Simon, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. So um, you can see the title of the, the presentation there. It's, it's obviously modelling in 9 versus 9.1. 9 um, so, of course, we've got sort of the differences and, and understand a little bit from modelling point of view what the, um, I guess, the upgrade path would be. Um, so anyway, that's the that for today. Um, when we have a look at that, it sort of drill down. Uh, the basic first point I want to sort of explore is well, what has actually changed? Um, so I, I've been instrumental in, in sort of the edits and things like that. So I have a pretty deep understanding of the actual difference between the two. I, I obviously can do the discussion all the way back to TOGAF 2008 and TOGAF 8.1 as well um, and have a sort of about that. But this is what's changed and what do the changes mean from a modelling point of view? I mean, of course, for those organisations out there that have already started to model according to TOGAF 9, um, what's required to go up to 9.1, and indeed, um, you know, when this happened many times, and we've seen the path happen, and it's pretty painless, and that's what I'll sort of talk people through today. Um, okay, so um, I guess the thing that I'm not going to talk about too much is the people certification side of things. Um, there's other people, certainly in the open group, that can, can talk about that in detail. Um, as far as I know, it's um, obviously separate things, 9 and 9.1. I think both will be, be certified until um, the middle of June next year, but then from, from June 2013 onwards, I think it's sort of going to be switched over to 9.1, um, mandatory thing. But anyway, people can certainly answer that more. What I'll be certainly talking about is the, the, um, the, the sort of link side of things and the tool side of things. So that's Tim O'Neill. I'm a, a fellow at UTS. Um, I'm also a um, I've felt the open group and, and why I've got a pretty deep understanding is I've been a co-chair of the, the TOGAF Tools Certification Committee. So I've, I'm kind of partially responsible for those 600 um, shells that some of you may know about in terms of the requirements that they're looking to certify tools against. So I'll sort of talk through some of that as well today. Um, I guess the other thing is I've only got about sort of 20 slides, so I'm not too sure. I, sort of, I, I think I'll probably take about half an hour, so we should certainly have plenty of time for questions afterwards. And, and of course, if we don't take the full hour slot, that's, that's fine as well. So we should, be, we should have plenty of time today. So I guess the, the thing from a background point of view, and, and I guess as you can see there, the, the whole idea is we all know TOGAS 1,000 pages, or the best part thereof. Um, you know, it's a pretty fuzzy, pretty messy, pretty, pretty difficult difficult um, kind of area to get into. So, so I put together a little wordle here to try and sort of look at what the topics are that are involved. Literally all I took was the um, introductory chapter um, for the, the standard and, and pumped it into wordle, which is a great little tool you guys all know about. Um, that's, so the, the encouraging thing to see at least there is architecture as the, the predominant theme that comes through, but things like enterprise and business get a look in and you know, management and stuff like that. So hopefully what I'll do today is of course talk people through a little bit of that um, complexity and, and hopefully make it a little, little bit less, um, well, a little bit more understandable. Um, so that's my goal today. Right. So the actual line, and this is a quote um, from the from the release, um, talk about what's changed. So it basically says, and I'm sure we can all read that, it says that it's a maintenance update um, based on feedback. So we, of course, along many other organisations, provided feedback on TOGAF 9. TOGAF 9 came out in, in 2009, certainly over two years ago now. Um, a fair bit of feedback and, and 
one, um, as it is known, pretty much started even before nine came out. But as to say, it's upwards compatible. So certainly thing that, that applies in nine certainly has some traceability through to 9.1. So, so that's what I'll sort of talk a bit about from a modelling point of view is, is some of that upwards compatibility today. But that's the, the official line. Of course, should be familiar to everyone. Um, it's the picture that, that everyone uses to try and describe the structure of HOGAF. Um, so I won't spend too long on this other than to say that we all know there's, there's three main areas to the step. There's the capability framework, the, the architecture development method slash content framework, and then the enterprise continuum um, part of things. We've really got that, you know, those sort of three main areas broken up into then seven chapters. Um, I'm hoping everyone's familiar with that. I do have a slide. The next slide actually just does give a quick summary of each one. So the, really, the reason I wanted to pull this in uh, and, and sort of talk at this for a little bit was to, to get an appreciation of, of the way we see things. So we often talk about the, the content framework um, as the bridge between theory and practice. So, of course, the ADM and the guidelines and all that sort of stuff is kind of the theory. Um, practice is, of course, the tooling for things and the deliverables and all those sort of things. So, so of course, the, the, the content framework is that... Um, prescriptive way in which you can do modelling according to TOGAF. Now we would all know hopefully that it's only been present since TOGAF 2008 uh, so it certainly wasn't in the TOGAF 8 series. Um, it's the new, the major new thing that's really coming in. Um, we can debate about that and say from my point of view it's the major major addition in the TOGAF 9 series. So, so to say it's, it's the bridge and that's the main thing I'm going to focus on today. It ended in seven parts. Technically, there's, there's more. There's appendices and things like that. But we're all familiar with that. I don't want to spend too long on that. I, I, I literally just put this in as a bit of a, um, a placeholder in case people you know, haven't, aren't familiar with the, nine, the 900 pages that are there. But needless to say, there are the seven parts uh, as per that structure picture before. And the main parts I'll sort of be looking at are some of those middle ones around ADM and content framework and, and things like that, which, which I'll certainly talk through in the next few slides. So let's have a look. Um, so this is a, a screenshot from, um, there's a white paper out there and there's various presentations that have been done to talk in detail about what the changes are. Indeed, there's a, um, there's a document out there um, which is called the Technical Agendum 1. Um, it's a, oh heaven knows, 400, page, 400 slide summary of exactly the change between F9 and 9.1. Um, so that's the you know the change by the delta, at the most excruciating detail that you can imagine. Let's say this is a summary of it. So if we sort of through each of the areas at the top there in, in part one, it's mainly editorial things, some clarifications. Part two, once we get into the ADM though, there is some real reworking of some of the phases and some of the processes. Certainly around um, the deliverables that are getting in there being explicit, uh, what's coming in and out of each phase. Um, if we get into the guidelines, there's a fair bit of work. Uh, I mean, that chapter, or that part, sorry. I mean, there's a lot of work around um, the different techniques um, that can be used um, to support the ADM, of course. Now, that, of course, brings you on to part four, which is the kind of the, the, the recommended um, approach to doing it, which is you know, obviously the content work. So there's been a lot of work around the, um, the different artifacts and how they can be cleaned up. And that's a lot of what I'll talk through today is, is a lot of the stuff around that, how you can actually do this in practice. Um, from the continuum point of view, um, um, I guess I went to it before, that, that whole tool, there was a chapter in there that was about um, tool selection, but that of course is now, um, in inverted commas, I guess exploded into the whole um, tool conformance requirements that we've got, the 700 requirements. Um, so, so anyone uh, look at those, and it's, it's certainly a very detailed list, and, and there's obviously uh, um, yet to be released um, some sort of conformance to that, but that's all going to come soon. So needless to say, that was taken out of part five because we had a much better elaboration on that. And then the last few bits, not much, not much has changed. So you can, again, you can see from this that the core of the delta is really in the middle there, around chapters two, three, four, um, and, and there's obviously some some, re some reductions in uh, part five. And that's where we're going to focus two, three, four um, for the rest of this sort of slide deck. Just sort of have a look at the, what the details are. Um, from a modelling point of view. Okay, so so I guess I've alluded to those those 700 requirements that are out there. Um, this is a summary of, of the, those requirements as far as the um, tool conformance requirements go. Um, it's just a bit of a percent percent pie, whatever, as you can see. Um, it does, I think it speaks for itself. Um, part two and part four, which if we all remember is the architecture development method, and then part four is the content framework, part three is the guidelines and tools. 
So that really accounts for the, the bulk of the requests from a tooling point of view, which of course are somewhat traceable to the requirements from a modelling um, point of view. So that's the best part of 90%, I think, if my maths is correct. So really, again, that supports the focus that, that we've got around modelling, um, so around um, those parts of the, the standard in sort of today's discussion, indeed, is, is the fact that it's pretty much 90% of it is all focused on that sort of stuff. So where to focus? Okay, so 90%, um, it seems like, is on based around those parts of the standard when it comes to modelling. Um, and I guess I'll put this second bullet point in here really to try, I mean, I tried in many places to try and find the most succinct way of describing what you do. And, and this, this sort of sentence here was about the best I could come up with, was typically say something like, you know, architects produce content. We can, we can all argue about, you know, that content is appropriate for the stakeholders and all those sort of things. But needless to say, they produce content while executing the ADM. And we can all talk about whether it's you know, executing or not, but that's certainly a, a phrase that I've seen around or a word I've seen around. So you produce content while following the process or executing the, the method um, and hope following various guidelines that it gives. So I think that's a succinct way of saying things. So obviously what we're saying here is the production of content is really one of the primary things you're doing as an architect. You know, we all know that you make your phone books and your, your A0 plots on the wall, so I'd hope that we don't do that. But needless to say, we're making something. Uh, we're making electronic documents or, you know, publishable, navigatable websites, you know, who knows, but we're making some sort of content. So, of course, we sort of can conjecture that the architecture content framework then is really the modelling basis for everything. And that sort of goes back to that, that original statement I made about the ECF is the bridge between um, theory and practice. It really is the embodiment of how you do modelling as far as the, the standard goes. Okay, let's have a look at that um, in a little bit more detail. I mean, these slides are certainly just um, a bit of a quick summary of the, the ACF part. Um, so it talks about, just to make sure that you know, we're all, all, all talking from this page, um, it talks about um, things that are deliverables. It's about aspects called artefacts. Okay, it talks about building blocks. They're the three core, core aspects. Of course, it talks about an architecture repository being the, the, the place that this stuff's stored, and, and obviously Abacus is, is an example of those. Um, let's say a deliverable is a work product, so it's a document. Um, there's templates for things um, out there. There's word templates um, for these things. There's then artifacts. Now artifacts we'll look at a little bit more in the, in the next slide, but artifacts are essentially the views, and there was one of the changes that actually um, came between 9 and 9.1 was a bit more um, of concise usage of the term artifact over and above the usage of the term viewpoint. Okay, it's one, one aspect that, that's tried to be tightened up a bit artifact. Feel free to call it a viewpoint, and we can get back into the debates of the differences between the need to say um, they're reasonably synonymous. Building blocks are obviously reusable things to hopefully make make your, your job easier. So, you know, little starter packs, little, you know, accelerators, whatever, little patterns that you can use, you know, if you're looking at a web server pattern or something like that, are things that are um, described, and, and of course we all know in, in TOGAF it talks about you know, solution building blocks versus architecture building blocks. So, so things that are more concrete or, or you know, more abstract. So the main aspects of the content framework from a very high level, and if we drill into the, the concept around what they refer to as an artifact, okay, um, yeah, okay, basically artifacts are made from these content meta model parts. Okay, so obviously difficult to know what sort of group term we use here. But it talks about entities, okay, so objects or your, your boxes, your things, okay, so the nouns. So it has things like applications, data entities, so we'd all know the meta model picture, which I'll, I'll look at in a sec. I mean talk relationships between them. Um, so that's of course your your questions, your lines on the on the you know, between the boxes, all that kind of stuff. So they're the verbs. So, you know, an actor consumes a business service, let's say, statements like that. They have these artifacts, okay, which are the embodiment of those things. So they talk about um, basically catalogs, matrices, and diagrams. So three types of artifacts, three types of viewpoints. Catalogs are tables, matrices are grids with, with Xs and things in them. Diagrams are pictures, what often people call models in their own right. So they just say those three types of artifacts. So here's the picture. For the content meta model, um, this is the picture as it was in TOGAF 9. So, so we're winding the clock back about three years now. Um, box lines, the, the white part is 
of course, the core part of the content meta model, then the, the various coloured boxes of the extensions. Um, so there's your know, motivation extensions and data modelling extensions and things like that. Um, so that's as it was. Um, needless to say, hopefully we're all pretty familiar with that. It's a you know, it's an ontological model, it's a meta model. There's many of these here. Um, you know, it's obviously saying things can act. An organisation unit contains actors. You know, it's that kind of stuff. So it's talking about the the, the meta model. Do the quick little flip, and, and I'll probably go back and forth between these slides a couple of times. So that's AGAF nine. And if I do a little page down here, that's nine point one. So that's refreshed for you all. So I'll go back and forth a couple of times to retry and show you that hopefully you can see they're pretty similar. Okay, so I'll do it a couple of times. So unfortunately, exactly the same. So they got redrawn in different graphics package. But needless to say, um, very, very similar. The same boxes in all the same places with all the same names. And I'll get into that. Just a few changes, <laughs> a few heading changes, and a few subtle changes into those. So if you look at that, there really was a very minimal change between the two. Content model 9, 9.1. Okay. So let's just have a quick look now. So, so I've got the little red call out there to try and um, talk about. I've sort of used the term cosmetic. Um, I know that, that that's possibly not the, the, the appropriate term to use, but, but certainly it was a, you know, an aesthetic change. Um, the, the, the picture was redrawn. Um, and needless to say, there's a couple of changes. If you look in the title at the top here, um, it used to say back in nine, it used to say architecture principles, vision requirements and roadmap. Literally now it says just architecture principles, requirements and roadmap. And there was one subtle change here. If you, if you look back on nine, there was a little UML thing that crept in there. Okay, so that was a bit of legacy of the way it used to be described, a little aggregation symbol there, or um, I think it's Hazard or user, I can't remember UML. Needless to say, that's now been removed and been sort of cleaned up to try and be consistent with all the other notation. Okay, so from a actual kind of high level point of view, the meta models are almost identical. Okay, um, there were a few changes, a very minor changes around the definitions. Um, some of the definitions that changed a little bit was organization unit. Okay, there was a subtlety around the definition there, around what is an organization unit. Um, and there were some subtleties around the changes of what um, properties you could have against a location. Okay, so you see one type of element called location, but then you specify via an attribute or a property what type of location it is, so whether it's a, you know, a country or a region or a building, all that kind of stuff. So there were very, very minor, very subtle changes in the low levels of the meta model in terms of its attributes and in, oh, sorry, the, the um, entities' attributes and in terms of some of the entities' definitions, but certainly nothing, nothing to get too, too worked up about. So that's from the model point of view, very, very minimal changes. Okay. Now I did, I did a webinar um, a couple of weeks back, um, maybe a month ago, really, um, that they looked at um, what you could do and what it should be. Um, so there's a, there's work all know, hopefully at foot called TOGAF Next. So there's work around what um, the the you know the future could be from a meta modelling point of view. So we're having input to that. And I did a presentation the other week, a month about um, various hybrid meta models we could look at doing. So this is just a bit of a quick quick look back at what we did then. So again, looking at the 9.1 meta model, we made a bit of a call to say that the whole business side of things, so the whole business architecture and contextual architecture side of things, arguably could be ripped out and replaced with some other stuff. So I won't go into this too much. You can, as Simon mentioned, you can go and download um, the webinars. So go back and have a look at the hybrid hybrid modeling that I gave a month ago and really talks about how you could do this. This is what we've seen um, many clients do, um, is, is actually use a different top end to the metal. So they replace things with the way it's done in Microsoft Project, for example, in terms of, of how you can do the project side of things. They've used other notations um, like the business nation model to do the motivation extension instead of instead of the native um, TOGA. So there's any number of sort of suggestions there that are, that are really sort of treated reasonably well in a previous webinar, so I'd suggest you go and have a look at that. And you know, maybe the way we go in TOGAF next, we'll wait and see. It's, a, it's obviously a, you know, a consortium thing. Um, and then if you look at the bottom levels, we're suggesting some renaming. So if I just go back and forth a couple of times, a lot of the elements down here, we were we were saying that you know we really think you probably should clean these, these naming up. If you look at the, the left-hand side, there's physical data components, but then you look at the first description of physical data component and it says physical data components are databases. We've just found that it's much more palatable to people to use terminology that's a bit more um, generic 
um, that there's a heritage in, in a lot of the um, Gemini's terminology there. When you look at you know, logical application component, physical application component, that sort of stuff is a heritage of Gemini's IAS. So we can probably do away with that now. Anyway, that's, that's that. Um, have a look at that. That's what it probably could be if we were going forward, but certainly um, it is 9.1 as it is now. Let's have a look at viewpoints, um, viewpoints and artefacts. Um, so basically, again, remembering that it's kind of cleaned up and it's called artefacts now. It's not necessarily called viewpoints, but I still like to use the term viewpoints, a la you know, IEEE 1471 and, and all those good things. Um, to say they're broken up into those um, three types, catalogues, matrices, diagrams, and then there's core and extension ones, just like there's core and extension parts to the, the meta model. Um, so this is nine. So this is TOGAF nine and, and how, uh, or sorry, which types of um, artifacts um, you could, should produce. Um, so there were 10, catalog, 10 core catalogues, four extension catalogues. Um, there were um, 10 matrices, and then there was 15 core diagrams, 17 extension diagrams, depending on what you wanted to do. So I'll do a little, a little sort of um, left-right sort of switch. So that's 9.1, and I'll go back and forth a couple of times. Okay, so that's 9. Hopefully refreshing okay. That's 9.1. Again, hopefully you can see very, very similar. Okay, um, I'll obviously talk through the changes, but in large parts, very, very, very similar. Okay, so the changes, and I'll, I'll redline them here. Okay, so the most significant change, and I know this is, you know, is a bit of a stretch to use the word significant, was a naming, a tightening up of the naming a lot of, of a lot of the artifacts. So if you're just back in, um, in nine, a lot of the places it was called system, so system organization matrix, role system matrix, um, system data matrix, okay? Whereas if you go back to the meta model, it tends to be called application component, application component, okay? So there was obviously the decision that we need to be consistent in the naming of the viewpoints according to the way the meta model is. So that's why we got application. So action got a look in all these different places. If you look over here, business service actually got added. It used to just be service information diagram. So there was a bit of tightening up to say that, of course, it was a business service here. Okay. So some of those things. And then, of course, the main area here was this. So around data, data diagramming, if we go back, you see there were only two core data diagrams, but then four extension diagrams in nine, now three core and um, three extension. So I'll talk through, because that's the most um, significant kind of change. Well, sorry, from a visual point of view, it looks like the most significant. We'll talk through what the implications of that are really in practice. So that's it. So it's really a sort of a system to application renaming and then a bit of a change to the data diagrams. So that's it from the view, sorry, from the artifact point of view. Um, um, 9.1 versus 9. Let's go and have a look at that in a bit more detail. Summary, of course, is to say that um, there was a bit of a, a global search and replace of you know, system to application, and was um, that core class diagram and the extension class hierarchy diagram became essentially two um, core data diagrams, so a conceptual or logical data diagram. And without wanting to overget too much, yep, that was about it. That was a change from a viewpoint, sorry, artifacts point of view. Um, I mean, in practice, well, so this has obviously been around for a while and we've seen it um, be used many times. So in practice, we've found they're pretty much the same. Okay, that's a snapshot of, of, of one of the, um, uh, the data, what's it called, the conceptual slash logical data diagram from 9.1. Um, this is the, actually, this is a snapshot out of the, there's an example project that the TOGAF, uh, sorry, the Open Group have, and so we've, of course, um, got that. So this is a snapshot of the, of the example project. So this view, um, you can see what it shows, and it describes what you're supposed to, what you're supposed to be showing. So it's basically showing uh, the encapsulation, as it's called, according to the meta model. So the encapsulation of data entities within logical data components. So down the bottom there, you can see customer complaint management is a logical data component, and it encapsulates those four data entities. Okay, so using the precise terminology of the, the meta model, as, as we should. Um, and then there's relationships between data entities. So data entities are related to each other. So you can see that you know customer details related to complaints, which is related to customer resolution. Oh, sorry, complaint resolution. Um, and then the, the final relationship that gets a look in on this view, on this artifact, 
see in this diagram is um, the provision consumption by services of these different data entities. So that's those green dotted ones. So they're business services. So that's in practice what you tend to see anyway. You tend to see a bit of a data model there, which is your, your classic ERD. You'll see it grouped into um, logical data components which we tend to call information safety areas, but either way, it's some sort of logical grouping of data entities and then how they are being um, used or you know, what do they provide or how do they consume by the data service, uh, business services. Sorry. Um, now, of course, there are other ways in which the um, data entity is used, but that's just, you know, they're the ones that are supposed to be on that diagram. Yeah, you've got your, your application data matrix and you've got various other ones and, and none of those changed in any way between 9 and, and 9.1. So practice, we've, we've found they tend to be the same. Um, so needless to say, the summary that I'd give there really is to say that, um, again, you know, without, without being too, too, too rude about it, you know, there's really been cosmetic changes to the meta model. That's what we've ultimately found. Um, there's a couple of definition changes, as we talked about. There's um, some attitude changes, but there's nothing significant there. Um, from a um, viewpoint, Point of, okay, I'm going to do it right. Artifact point of view. Um, there's some name changes, application system, and, and effectively, really just a renaming we've found of, of a lot of the data diagramming um, approaches. So, bottom line, um, you can see I'm obviously coming coming to the end here. Bottom line, in 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 commas, it really is just a bit of a global search and replace um, of system to application. Um, that's what we found. We, of course, have, have a 9.1 out of the box, so you can start with 9.1, but if you, you, of course, want to have 9, then um, you know, it's just a global search and replace. It's pretty easy to do. Um, and less, the conclusion really is that it's very, very painless. Um, should be done, and everyone should do it. There's no reason to stay legacy on 9. Uh, that's what we found. And a whole can of worms. To, to get into the discussion around TOGAF, uh, I guess I said 10 or next here, you, you saw that hybrid uh, model that I put forward before. So that, that's very much yet to be determined um, where we're going for TOGAF next, TOGAF 10 or TOGAF 9.2, who knows? Um, we certainly got an opinion on it, but needless to say, uh, um, we don't know where we're going yet, so it's hard to say what the migration path is going to be. Uh, um, you can safely see there's going to be some significant change, I, I would say, though. So anyway, we'll see where that um, turns out. The good old quotes, let's, let's conclude with... Don't forget it's all about, um, as much about art as it is about construction. Let's not get too caught up in the, the science. There's definitely some art here. Um, any older tool is still a fool. Don't, don't, you know, it's not solved the world's problems for you. Um, and you know, one of my favourites, you know, all are wrong, but some are useful. So you know, to, to appreciate that you know, nothing is that precise, but you know, hopefully it, it has some value. So that's it. Um, like I said, I, I expected to sort of get through it in sort of 30 minutes which it looks like about right, it's about half past now. Um, so say, um, drop us a line, and um, we can give you copies of all these things. Um, there's published versions, obviously grab a trial tool if you want, but needless to say, um, I'd open the floor for questions then, and, and uh, hopefully I, I did see a few come through. So Simon, if you, you want to read through them, that would that'd be great. That's great, Tim, and first I'd just like to say thank you very much. That's a, a really good um, explanation about the difference between TOGAF 9 and TOGAF 9.1 which I think is a subject that loads of people have been uh, really interested in, and um, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there. So thank you for that, uh, Tim. Oh, great. Um, you. We've got a couple of questions uh, currently in chat. So if you want to send in a question to Tim, you know, please just write it into the chat facility or in the Q&A facility, and this is the stage we can, uh, we can address those questions. The first question, I think, um, uh, Tim, is from um, um, Steve Simmons, and I think he's referring to that original meta-model diagram um, you were talking about the removal of um, vision, and he's asking, is the removal of the, the removed vision captured anywhere else uh, in 9.1? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess the short answer, uh, sorry, Steve, the short answer, Steve, is no. Um, so you can see here, if you go between um, so 9.1 and that's 9. Okay, so if I go back and forth, back and forth, okay, so 9 and 9.1. Okay, so so yeah, so what you're referring to obviously is the fact that this um, up here, the the vision word has been removed. Now that's my understanding. My understanding was it was a bit misplaced. Okay, so you can see back in nine, sorry, um, back in nine, there was no actual occurrence of vision anywhere in there. If you, what I presume you're talking about is that, you know, is there an object type or 
an entity type called Vision anywhere. And no, there wasn't. There wasn't in, in name. There isn't in 9.1. If you look here, there's nothing, nothing called Vision in here either. So essentially, my understanding was that it was really just taken out because it was a bit misleading. And why I would say it's a bit misleading was because when you look at the motivation extension, so when we're looking at these red bits out here, and if we look in 9.1, the, the slightly more garish red bits here, um, they are obviously the area that's trying to address that, that concept. So the concept around um, you know, your organization's motivations and drivers and goals and all those different things. So that's it. So they were just trying to be a little bit more precise and not trying to um, introduce another concept which arguably doesn't exist. So especially, Steve, if you're talking about something like OMG's business motivation model, so OMG MM does explicitly have a concept called a vision, and it has missions and it has means and it has ends and it has all these other things, including you know, drivers and goals and stuff like that and objectives. So that's, that's my understanding, and I'll go and dig into it, to be honest, if, um, the technical agenda, if you, if you want me uh, a note, I'll, I'll dig into the technical core agenda and, and send you the, the rationale because there'll be a very well-worded description of why vision was actually taken out. My reflection is it was really just a, a bit of um, you know, a bit of oversight there around the, um, you know, without trying to, to make it ambiguous because you can see here there's obviously requirements which matches, there's principles which matches, um, roadmaps doesn't exist anything either but they wanted to just make it clear that there wasn't something called vision in there. Okay. Great, thank you for that. I've um, got a question here on the chat facility or on the QA facility. This is from Naveen Kumar. And I think this is a very pertinent question given that we're moving from 9, point, or 9 to 9.1. Uh, Naveen's asking, he's asking if TOGAF 10 would be coming out soon, and we don't know what soon is, and he's saying a year, um, should he spend time getting himself familiar with 9.1 or wait for the potential deployment of 10? <laughs> Any news on that question? Yeah, question. Then. I mean, look, it's, I guess it's the, how long is the string. I mean, we could get into some interesting debates there. I mean, look at the timelines. Nine came out in um, 2009. 9.1, which was only, uh, um, what would I say, an incremental, you know, well, what was the official line? It was a maintenance update. That took over two years. <laughs> so to produce, so there's absolutely no chance that, that um, TGAF 10, even if it's going to be called that, um, is going to come out within the next two years. So, so that would be the first thing I'd say is that um, do you want to wait to do your modelling for two years? I'd argue not. Um, so I'd, I'd argue you get on the 9.1 bandwagon for now. Um, and then it does come into the what is going to happen, and, and we can start talking about you know dot point upgrades versus full point. You know, obviously if it's 9.2, I would argue in any philosophy it should be a forward compatible thing. It should be a pretty easy and painless upgrade path, exactly as it was between 9 and 9.1. So, of course, there'll be a 9.2 that comes out in, let's say, two years' time, which has four cleanups of things. You know, in a beautiful, maybe it has some of these cleanups. You know, some of these things, you know, are going to take us the best part of, of you know, a year to two years to agree, okay, and change everything and get all the consortium to agree. So that would be an evolution, not a revolution, of course. If you're going to sort of stuff, that's a revolution. Okay, so basically when you look at TOGAF, TOGAF Next, and, I, and I'd encourage you, and I'm not sure if you are involved in the, the working group already on TOGAF Next, but there's essentially a few camps there. Um, so there's one camp, which is, of course, the evolutionary camp, which says, why don't we just do a bit of a maintenance fix to it, because I can tell you we, we already have a list of all the things that are a bit inconsistent, you know, the different relationships that needed to be added. You know, so there's, there's, I can tell the relationship that needed to be added between here and here to allow you to produce one of the viewpoints. But that's you know, the way it is. So there's a number of different um, updates that still need to be done to make it fit for purpose, which I would campaign should go into a 9.2. Um, that's one camp. There's another camp, which is, of course, the revolutionary camp that says, you know, rip and replace, start again. Um, we know more than we knew whenever it was we did this, so let's start again. And then there's the other camp, which is the Archimate camp. Okay, so I'm going to debate about what sort of influence Archimate should have because it's a completely different meta model and it's a completely different... Um, notation. So we need to sort of understand, well, what role could, should Archimate's meta model play in the TOGA 9.1 meta model? Because they're not the same. They are different. And they shouldn't ever be described as the same. They're completely different meta models. Um, there is, of course, a notation in Archimate. So potentially we could adopt the notation from Archimate or some parts of it into TOGAF 9 without changing the meta model. That's probably some middle ground. 
but it's you know I, I would be cautious to to say um, we you know wholeheartedly adopt the Archimate meta model as the TOGAF meta model. Like those things are in direct um, well, I wouldn't say competition, but they're certainly different. So that's very hard to say. All I can say is if we went any of those revolutionary paths, you're looking at multiple years before that sort of thing comes out. I mean, the, the, so 8.1 was, what, 2003, 2000, 2008 came out in 2008, um, 9 came out in 2009, 9.1 came out in, in the end of 2011, start of 2012. So as far as a, a release schedule goes, you're not going to a couple of years off, and, and TOGAF 10 is many years off. Long answer, I know, to probably a simple question, but that's that's for my take on it. I'm just one voice, though, so, so who knows what the future is going to hold. No, that's good, Tim. I think it's you, what you're highlighting there is uh, getting consensus always takes a little bit of time. So, um, oh, look, I mean, I've been doing standards for 20 years, so don't worry. You know, you, you learn patience is one of the, the first things you learn whenever you become involved with standards bodies. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think we have uh, two very relevant questions here because the impact of 9.1 and the questions are from Carl Shah and from uh, Clement Montadori. And they're both asking, and is uh, the certification exams going to include TOGAF 9.1? Oh, okay, I'm not sure. The certification exams, do we mean the people certification exams, given that there isn't really an equivalent for, um, for, for the, so the tooling side of things is obviously a tool certification thing. Yeah, I think so, it's probably professional certification, I think they're referring to, Tim. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm well, okay. I'm not the best person to answer this. Um, I know there's an FAQ. If, if, I mean, best, best thing I can say is search search on the site. There's a FAQ that I know talks about exactly this stuff because obviously it's a frequently asked question. So search search. I'm assuming you're an open group member. Search the 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 site once you're logged in. For, uh, I think it's called 9.1 FAQs, and it talks exactly about that. So it talks. I, if I'm going I'm going to guess here, and I could be completely wrong, but what I believe is. Um, June 1st, 2012, so we're talking about three months, two months. Um, I think you're allowed to start testing people for 9.1 conformance. I think there's a new set of conformance requirements that will be out. And then until June 2013, um, people can get certified in both. But after 2013, I think people have to get certified in 9.1. So, again, that could be completely wrong. Read the AQs. It, it does give it explicitly. Um, so there's obviously some period of crossover between the two um, that, that's going to last us a bit out of another 18 months, I think. So, do you think I mean, the that... FAQ is a good idea? But by the way, if, if, um, if you are uh, struggling to find an answer to that question, everyone, um, get my email address uh, with the URL for the recording tomorrow. Feel free to contact me and I'll make sure that your questions are passed through to the uh, professional certification team who can ask those questions directly for you. So feed to uh, contact me. Uh, Tim, we've got a couple of other questions here. The two from um, uh, Shalom Mullins. I'm going to wrap these together. And Shalom's asked two questions. So his first question is, uh, what we struggle with is information. And he says, data, data architecture, distinction, relationship. Uh, do you have any guidance there? Um, we're well defined. So any thought there? And his second question is, what is notation? Where is the meta model for the notation? focusing in on is this part, this part here, the data architecture domain, um, the data modeling side of things. Um, you, you're dead right. Um, so let's assume we're going to start with 9.1, because um, obviously I, I sort of highlighted that that's one of the areas that has changed um, between the two. So we come into the viewpoints around, sorry, the artifacts around 9.1. So we're looking at these areas here. They have conceptual and logic data diagrams, and they've split that. So that used to just be called a class diagram back in TOGAF 9. Um, so which you see, if you, if you go here, it was a class diagram. So class diagram became conceptual logical data diagrams. Um, I'll certainly pick up on your point about notation um, as, as I get there. Um, so there's obviously seven, oh, sorry, what am I saying, six views, four, um, three um, extension diagrams. You do have these other ones. So you do have matrices and you have catalogs. Okay, so there's obviously tabular descriptions of the data side of things. So as far as that goes, you're looking at extension here to get into data security diagrams, data migration diagrams, data lifecycle diagrams. So there's plenty of guidance in the standard about how to do those and the sort of things that you could do. Um, so I guess you could possibly, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll probably get shot for this, but you could possibly...
probably make the same claim about each of the areas. You know, I would contend that the standard isn't that um, prescriptive about what you do about application landscaping, about what you do about technology, you know, life cycle management, about the service management. I argue that each of them are kind of light. Um, now, the surprising thing about the 900-page standard is that you don't have, you know, a very prescriptive way, and and I guess that. To be expected. When you're ascended, you have to kind of accommodate everybody, and so there's many different techniques. So you've got whole part three, which is of course talking through um, the different techniques for doing things. So aside from from opening those pages, there'll be numbers of pages there to talk about how to do things. Now, the second question though is, you're right. The TOGAF, one of the big flaws. There's two big flaws with the TOGAF nine content meta, uh, the content framework. One is that there is no notation. You're exactly right. Now, framework uh, clogs and matrices, they're fine because they're tables and they're, they're, they're matrices, you know, so you don't really need a notation for those. So we're talking about it from a diagramming point of view. So what you're up with, of course, is each vendor need to come up with our own notation. Okay, so we do do that. So if you buy because there is a notation for TOGAF, and our notation. We've, of course, used, you know, used it hundreds of times and hundreds of clients have used it, so it just exists. Because it's flexible, you can change the notation tomorrow and you could use anything you want as your notation. But TOGAF itself is not prescriptive around notations. So that's one of the big flaws, is you're asked to do an application landscape diagram. So if we go back in here and look, there's one called application communication diagram. Well, there's nothing that says necessarily how that should be done. The guidelines will give you a number of ways you could do it and an example. And of course, as the standard goes, it says choose the one that's appropriate for your organisation and your stakeholders, which I think is prudent. Um, so need to say um, it's a bit of a flaw because to get a stake in the ground, I think they probably need to come up with a notation. So there's, I think there's work happening that direction in TOGAF Next. Um, is you know different notations because if we're talking about, for example, down here, um, a process diagram, we're pretty happy with using business process modelling notation to do that. You know, listing um, notations out there that we should just reuse. And of course, if we're talking class diagram, sorry, a conceptual logical data diagram, why wouldn't we do a class diagram, use a UML class diagram as our notation there? So I think that's largely the way that, that it might head, which is exactly what I talked about here. Exactly talking about why aren't we reusing existing notations for these different areas? You know, why are we trying to you know, reinvent the wheel? But anyway, um, you're dead right, there is no notation. Um, we, of course, have a notation. Um, you, can, you, know, you can invent your own, um, but yeah. I mean, I'd, all I'd say about the other four is that there is only the three types of views that you have here, which is catalogs, matrices, diagrams. We strongly believe that charting and charts is an essential viewpoint you need. So the humble pie chart is you know, fundamental to doing enterprise modelling. Anyway, that's, that's it. it's not the, it's no framework in the world has charts as part of its views, but see, at least TOGAF has catalogs and matrices because most frameworks just have diagrams. You look at something like Archimate. All Archimate is is a collection of diagrams. It doesn't have any um, concept talking about catalogues and matrices, largely because there's no attributes at all in Archimate. It is, you know, largely just a notation with a, obviously the meta model. So, is it? I think hopefully that sort of covered it. That's great. Many thanks for that. Uh, well, I notice that we're coming up to nearly quarter two, and we don't seem to have any more uh, questions on the text at the moment. So I think it's probably a good uh, opportunity uh, to uh, call an end to the uh, event today. Tim, I'd like to thank you again for your usual uh, insight into this subject. I think uh, that's very, very helpful. I'd like to thank you all for attending today's uh, presentation. Um, please do keep an eye on the uh, Open Groups webinar schedule because we have an on schedule of webinars uh, in place. Um, so we'd like to hear you uh, in this film. So once again, Tim, thank you very much. And I think I'll call it an end, yeah? Oh, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Simon.